Hello. In this video, I wanted to talk about using Boost Polygon and Boost Geometry. I'll walk through the basic data structures that are available. I found that the documentation pages on the Boost website, for people that don't know the libraries already, it's it's not necessarily clear and obvious what the data structures are that you should use. Talk about some of the pros of each of the two libraries, show some of the interesting use cases of them, as well as some gotchas, perhaps bugs uh, of each side. In my own application, I use both. I convert from one to the other when needed. Uh, mostly I am using Boost Polygon uh, because of the uh, performance of it. So Boost Polygon, I found that it is significantly faster. In particular, if you have many polygons that you want to merge into one, uh, Boost Geometry doesn't have a one pass uh, way to, to merge them all together, whereas uh, Boost Polygon does. As an example, say that you have this uh, printed circuit board layout. When viewed in GURB view, many of these things look like they are already merged single polygons, but they're actually not. Here we have a copper pore and it has this outline, but in the Gerber files, you also have many of these outline things. So in my application, I needed to merge them all together and Boost Polygon made this really easy at least easier than Boost uh, Geometry. On the other hand, Boost Geometry, it continues to be actively maintained. Boost Polygon has not seen a lot of action uh, in recent years. I've also found that for Boost Geometry, the bloat or inflate uh, operation behaves better. I'll show more about what I mean by that. And also it has a feature that you can generate paths with rounded edges, which in my particular application makes it convenient. Coming back to my first example, Again, Gerber files are generally circles swept across a line, which really is just a line that is bloated with rounded edges. So Boost Geometry made this easy. Even though it's actively maintained, I still like using it, but perhaps that is because of my own background. Uh, I happen to know that for Manhattan, which is only vertical and horizontal uh, lines, as well as 45 degree polygons, it is very well tested. It has been used within Intel for optical proximity correction. Uh, because of the scale of the designs at Intel, performance was really important. Uh, once upon a time I worked there and I worked with the author of the Boost Polygon Library. Uh, Luke, if you ever come across this, how's it going? So I have a little bit more insight and trust into the reliability of Boost Polygon. All right, so enough talk. So let's actually get to some uh, real use cases. So first let's just go through a simple little demo. Here for Boost Polygon, I will also show something similar for Boost Geometry. But for Boost Polygon, creating a polygon is a matter of creating a list of points. Here I have four, these constitute a box. So for this polygon, I set the points to be these four points. Additionally, next I have a second set of points. This is also a rectangle, but it is offset a little bit, a little up and to the right. Here I am setting the points using vector begin and end. Here before I was using a static C array. Now I have two polygon sets to which I've added the polygons a little bit different. For one, I've used the plus operator and for the other, I've used the pushback vector. Polygon set is a vector, but, but the plus equal behaves a little different. Let me show you what I mean. This is the result of using pushback. Since it's a list, I simply have two polygons. One of them is the lower box, the other is the upper box. If however, I use the plus equal, you'll see here that the polygons have been merged. Continuing on, even though here I use the push path method on PS2, I can still merge them by using the assign operator. So here PS3 is assigned with PS2 and then showing, I end up with the same result as the plus equal. This can be important if you have many, many polygons. If you do a plus equal, it will continually try to merge them as you go. But if you know that you're going to be merging them all together later, uh, it's better to do a push back, just maintain the list and then use the assign to sweep through all of them. Finally, within this file, we see that I have points three, which is yet another box, a smaller box, which now I am subtracting from the first list of polygons. And that yields this guy. We have the same two boxes as before merged together with this little box here removed. This line here is an artifact of how I am displaying this particular polygon. Within GTL, you have the option of saying, I want to be able to have holes, in which case it would just say you have the outer boundary and you have the inner boundaries as well. Or you can say, I don't want any holes. And so in this case, I am displaying without holes. In order to model this, it slices the boundary along this point here so that you have a hole. Uh, the overall region of this polygon is still the same, uh, except for you have this additional part on the boundary. So that's a basic demo of using the GTL polygon operations. Note that the files that I'm demonstrating today are all available on my GitHub, and there'll be a link down below. But let's look a little bit at the types. So there are a number of basic data types that are provided by the Boost Polygon library. 
some portions of the Boost library in general use the word model. So here are some of the models or uh, data structures that are available within the Boost Polygon library. When you look at the Boost Polygon library page, as well as many of the other Boost modules, it stresses the fact that you can wrap an existing data structure uh, and just apply uh, the operations through template metaprogramming and all that other whiz bang stuff. But sometimes you don't necessarily need to implement your own polygon. You just want to use whatever works for that library. And that's what I found works best for me. So you can either have a polygon with holes or you can have a polygon without holes. We then ask the polygon with holes. That's the one I generally use. Hey, tell me uh, what's, your, what's your point type. Uh, you can have a polygon set that either has holes or you can also have a type dev here of polygon with no holes. Note that this is simply a vector of polygon set, which is a little different than for uh, boost geometry, uh, where a where it has its own multi-polygon uh, data structure defined. I also define some convenience uh, standard out uh, writing operators here as well. All right, so that was some basics of uh, using the boost polygon library. I'll come back to that, but let's also talk about the boost geometry. Here again, I am creating the same polygon as before, which I here I have a multi-polygon before I use the polygon set. A multi-polygon is basically a vector, though not as directly as for the boost polygon library. So we push back here, polygon two, push back again. Now note this time that we do not have the plus operator. So we don't necessarily merge as we go. It just like with uh, boost polygon, I now just have a list of uh, polygons. Looking at that, I have the same polygons as before. Now it gets a little bit tricky. I can take my polygon set and simply use the union operator with an empty polygon set. The result, however, is the same as what you had before. No unioning was actually done. The issue here is that boost geometry assumes that the two arguments to the union operator have already been merged. So while in boost polygon, it will always just sort of re-merge everything for you. Here, you need to sort of binary tree merge things up. Or you can do a linear, add one geometry at a time, but, but that could be really slow, all right? So instead, now, if we do a union with the two polygons that we had before, this time we have it merged. But again, you can only do this on two polygons. Now note there are a couple ways that you can create polygons. Here, using static initialization for the first polygon. For the second polygon, I am creating a ring, which a ring really is just a sequence of points that define a boundary. A ring is used for the outer uh, edges as well as for the holes. So in this case, I take polygon two. I say, hey, the outer should be this ring and thereby I now have my polygon. A third way here is instead of creating a ring, I can simply create a vector of boost geometry points. When you call the outer method of a polygon, it returns to you a pointer to the actual ring that is inside that polygon. And since that ring behaves like a standard sequence, you can then use the assign method to give those points. So again, here I have my third polygon, which I will then subtract from the first two, which I have already properly unioned up here, okay? So I end up with PS3, which I can then display. Note that in this case, I do not have the no holes option and the way that I display boost geometry shows things as polygons with their holes, all right? So let's look at the types that are involved here. So in this case, I define a point in 2D space. I then define a polygon, which uses that kind of point. The second false is whether or not things are clockwise or counterclockwise. That will, I will talk about that in a moment. A multi-polygon is basically a vector. And if I go into the header file within the boost geometry area, I end up with this. A multi-polygon is a subclass of this container where by default container is standard vector. So basically it's a vector, but it is derived from it. So coming back to my test two example here. So there are a number of ways in which boost geometry polygons can be invalid. One of them is order. In this case, we have going from the origin to the right first and then up, so counterclockwise, which matches what I have in my polygon type definition. The second false indicates that it is to be counterclockwise, which we see here. Clockwise is true or false would be counterclockwise. Additionally, by default, a ring must also be closed. So here we see true by default is closed. True for pl closed polygons, meaning that the last point is equal to the first point which in this case is not true. It should be zero, zero as the last point. So by default, in this demo, I do a correction. True here, by default, 
So I call boost geometry correct and it will do those fixes for you. To check whether or not a geometry is valid, you use the is valid operator. If instead I were to pass in no correct to this program, I will get a different set of answers. So before, before for test 2C, I was getting the correct result. Now instead, I just get this box. The reason why polygons are not valid. Something to be aware of. Moving along to test demo three. This is back in the boost polygon world. If I take my rectangle from before, and this time I do a plus equal not with a polygon, but rather with a number, what it will do is it will inflate the value. Then I also will add my original polygon back to the beginning, getting this. So here we see that we have our original polygon, and then I've inflated it by 100, which basically um, the previous width was 100, and I'm adding 100 to both sides. So now we have a 300 by 300 box instead. However, Boost Polygon, at least in the All Angles implementation, has some issues. Say that I start with this particular polygon, and note again that we do not have any curved edges. Uh, these are all individual segments. Uh, there's just a bunch of them making it look curved. We start with this, and then we inflate that by 5,000, which in the scale of this one is not a lot. But what you end up with is this. We have our original, and then we have the inflated in blue. Now, this is not really what I would have expected when inflating this object. I have these weird zigzaggies. I also get some holes here. I get this guy over here. And my guess as to what's happening here is you have two almost parallel wires when you inflate them, when you move them over, and then you try to join their endpoints. Because they're almost parallel, the connection point will be way off in the distance somewhere. And that's what yields this goofiness here. For the all angles generalized polygon concept of the boost polygon library, I have found that the inflate feature, this happens often enough that it's not usable for me. I found that it's not just a matter of one or two bugs here and there. This happens a fair bit. And this is probably the primary reason why I also use the Boost Geometry Library. Um, I like the performance of Boost Polygon and I like the buffering behavior of Boost Geometry. I'd now like to take a moment for a shameless plug. I'm available for freelance programming projects. Let me know if you're interested. So in boost geometry, the buffer operation is the equivalent of boost polygons inflate operation, which before appeared as the plus equals with a number. In boost geometry, you have some additional options. Where two edges come together when you're buffering, you could round those edges, or you could choose to not round those edges as determined by the strategy pointers. In the case of rounding, you need to tell it how much rounding to do. So let's look at the results of that. First, I call buffer with result one as the output and rounding. And then I call buffer with result two and a little bit more of an inflation value going into result two. And then I append result two onto the beginning of result one so that we can have one simple uh, inflate for output. And that gives us this. This one here has rounded edges. This little bumpiness here is more a matter of how I am displaying it and does not reflect any craziness in the actual uh, result. And this one here is the mitered edge version of it. So if you wanna be fancy smancy and how are you using this buffering command, you could take this set of polygons, you could deflate it by this amount and then inflate it again by the same amount, which will yield this. The red is the original and the blue is what happens after. There's a little bit of goofiness here that we can mostly ignore. Here we'll see that some things have disappeared. You might ask yourself, what was I actually computing here? But I'll leave that as an open riddle to you. One thing to note in this particular example is that here I was reading merged out here into a polygon set, a GTL polygon. In order for me to use buffer, I need boost geometry. So to assist me in going back and forth, I have implemented some GTL polygon two, which GTL is either graphics template library, geometric template library, I forget which uh, it stands for, it's boost polygon. Uh, to, so to convert from boost polygon to boost geometry, I have these functions here, which I can find here in polyutils, where I'm just basically doing the dumb thing where I go through each polygon and I add points, I add holes going in both directions. Not particularly exciting, to look at. So then once I have this multi polygon, I can then call a buffer. So moving along to the next test, boost geometry is not without issues of its own. It is also somewhat susceptible to the edges almost parallel going off into the distance uh, and not really behaving with buffer. Here is an example to show you. We have this fairly innocuous piece of polygons. However, if you 
were to, however, if you were to deflate it by this amount, we would then generate this guy. So let's show them side by side. The red is the original and the blue is what you get after. So looking at the blue a little closer without the red, it looks nothing like the previous results. The overall outer boundary has disappeared and what used to be holes has actually become uh, polygons of their own. Go back to my previous uh, thing here. Blue here, holes have become polygons and this outer boundary has gone away altogether. Now note that I'm not of inflating, note that I'm not deflating by all that much, right? It's not like these two things here came together and then the polygon disappeared. I think that this is basically the same issue that we see on the boost polygon side. Uh, it does not happen nearly as often. The workaround that I found works well for me is to call boost geometry simplify operation on each of the polygons in the input. In this case, I am simplifying by a very small amount. Remember here, I was deflating by almost 4,000. There's a small amount in the grand scheme of things. 10 is not a lot. But when I do that, I get a deflated polygon that is more what uh, you would expect. So something to be aware of. Again, this does not happen a lot. So in this example, I want to demonstrate a feature that Boost Geometry has that I found very helpful that Boost Polygon does not have. Here, I create a line string, which is really just a sequence of points. So a ring before was a boundary. A line string is just a bunch of points that then define a line. So in this case, again, 0, 100, 0, 200, 1, uh, 200, 200. And I can buffer a line, just like I could buffer a, a polygon. And I could buffer either with rounded edges and ends, or I could buffer with mitered edges and flat ends. So let's look at the results of that. Here we have the rounded edges. Here we have flat edges. Here we have them both. So the end of the line string was here. So note here that rounded edges goes a bit beyond the flat edge. The point that is given in the line string is coincident with the end of the um, end of the polygon. In any case, I hope that this video has helped you get started with using the Boost Polygon and Boost Geometry libraries. As always, please leave comments.